Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to welcome you all at the EBPF Summit this year. I'm Shweta Saraf, and I'm here to take you on a thought-provoking journey of imagining a world without EBPF. It's unthinkable, right? On one hand, we are so used to all the possibilities that EBPF has unlocked, and it's hard to imagine a world without EBPF unless you have seen the evolution of the technology. But on the other hand, imagining the dark days without EBPF allows you to appreciate how much we owe to this technology and what can we learn from it. So the first thing that comes to mind is the kernel patching nightmare. The world would be bogged down by long debugging cycles and numerous kernel patches that need to happen without EBPF. This would just result in incremental costs of building software, high CPU usage, high resource usage, and that would just result into a long cycle of frustration and slow development cycle to fix issues that are really complex. The life would look a lot like this Dilbert comic, full of frustration and endless debugging loops would become a daily grind. What about performance bottlenecks in cloud environment? We just assume that it's a given that we have tools that allow us to debug performance on a daily basis. But without eBPF, we would have to rely on good old tools like TCP dump, S-Trace, and in turn, those would require a lot more system resources. They would be highly inefficient, leading us to investing a lot of monetary dollars in monitoring the fleet at a high scale in a cloud environment. Not only the dollar value, but also the operational load of people who are working on these areas would be exponentially higher. So would be the investment in doing metrics or logging efficiently at a high scale. Let's not overlook security. Security is another one where in large modern microservices based architectures, it can't be an afterthought. It has to be built in from day one. Without eBPF, we would see way more security breaches in large scale infrastructure. Imagine having to deal with slow, clunky IP table based firewalls to debug these issues at scale instead of relying on eBPF. I want to do a shout out to Celium who has really enabled us to secure microservices based environments with ease. Without them, we would be not be able to do this in a highly efficient manner. My favorite topic, networking. So in the networking world, Kubernetes and networking would be a nightmare. It would be so manual and error prone and very high chances of misconfiguration, leading to slower routing of traffic and debugging issues that are already hairy to begin with. We would not be able to leverage deep packet inspection or tracing with ease, and we would need to rely on more intrusive and expensive technologies like traffic mirroring to solve the similar problems. Also, the tools that we take for granted, like, like SysDig or Tracy, would not be able to run kernel in kernel probes and overall just leading to this longer pace of uh, debugging or reasoning, uh, reaching to a resolution on the network issues. So we don't always know what kind of tools we would need for the future, but if we don't have ability to innovate and iterate faster, it will really hamper the pace at which we innovate. So that's what the world would look like without eBPF. And I want to take a moment to express gratitude to pioneers like Alexi and Daniel, who took the Berkeley packet filter and evolved it into the eBPF that we know today, which revolutionized the industry. So you might be wondering, why am I here talking about this? To introduce myself, I have been uh, building platform and products at scale for almost two decades in the space of cloud infrastructure and networking. I'm currently the director of platform networking at Netflix. 
And in past, I have worked on multiple companies ranging from hyperscalers to nimble startups at all stages. My mission in life is to really create the best environment where people can do the best work of their lives. And interestingly, EBPF has been a big part of that journey. So my journey with EBPF has been rewarding and it started back in 2020, uh, 2015 when EBPF was new and still growing. And I was just very curious about what EBPF could enable uh, as the industry was catching on to this momentum. So my first use case with EBPF was back in 2017 when I worked at DigitalOcean, a cloud provider specially designed for developers where we were implementing a rate limiter to access internal services over the virtual network. The virtual network was built with Open vSwitch and what eBPF enabled us to do was iterate very quickly on how can we do high scale rate limiting for access for these millions of droplets that run on top of it. It was really magical to see how fast the engineers could come up with the solution and productionize it. Fast forward to 2020, I joined another cloud provider packet and we were in the business of uh, running bare metal cloud. So an interesting thing happened when packet got acquired by Equinix and became Equinix Metal, we were partnering with CNCF to run an open source partner program. And as part of that, we were donating a lot of these bare metal servers to Celium devs who wanted to test their code uh, in a safe way, in an isolated way, uh, where performance, isolation, and um, security were important constraints. So a lot of devs benefited from that, and uh, it was a really interesting project. In 2023, I joined Netflix, and I'm grateful to serve on the EBPF Foundation board as the Netflix representative. So a lot of the revolutionary work uh, in EBPF observability space that was started by ben Brendan Gregg began at Netflix. So after he left and when I joined, I'm doing my own small part to keep the torch alive and continue the work on EBPF across the board at Netflix. So last year has been a year of experimentation with eBPF for us. We are doing a lot more hack days and idea thons and a lot of ideas have come through uh, which are betting on this technology and really solving business problems at scale. So uh, multi multiple use cases have emerged and some of those use cases are now running in production. Uh, and in 2024, we continue to also contribute back to the eBPF community by open sourcing some of these tools that are coming out of this team. So you might be wondering, what is the eBPF Foundation all about? It was created to create this cross-platform for eBPF-related projects uh, for the open source community to come together and collaborate in an independent way. So one of the cool things uh, that I get to do is uh, the recent partnership we did with the BSC members to allocate grants for research in eBPF in academic projects. And I'm proud to say that we got 50 plus applications and these were the five projects that were selected this year for the grants. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Netflix eBPF story that has evolved in the last few years. So the first interesting use case for us is the network observability sidecar. Why? Because Netflix is a very large distributed system eco uh, ecosystem built on top of AWS cloud. We have needs around understanding the network availability and network segmentation in such a large complex environment so that we are, as a network team, able to debug these issues very quickly and serve our customers who rely on us. Overall cloud infrastructure visibility and understanding the priority in which the traffic flows across different clusters is an important use case as well. We collect all of this data and also use it for traffic forecasting and 
uh, running it through a large ML model, which in turn allows us to do interesting things like traffic shaping and dynamically addressing traffic. So just to give you an idea, we are at 1 billion flows per day that go through this flow exporter sidecar. And that's the amount of data that we are able to process and ingest and infer insights from. So this is how it roughly works. We have different systems and uh, different compute environments where this sidecar is running. And the flow exporter sidecar flows into flow collector uh, where eBPF comes in really handy to achieve efficiencies of scale. Uh, and in turn, this data is piped into a big data store like Druid, where the data is then available for different partners and teams to use it in a democratized fashion for the use cases that I just mentioned. So the next use case, let's talk about noisy neighbor detection. This is a very common problem in high scale compute environments. And we are trying to leverage eBPF for compute use cases at Netflix. So one of the interesting things here is to instrument the kernel and understand more about the Linux scheduler in an efficient way. By doing so, we are able to detect these noisy neighbor problems which in turn can be really bad for application performance if not detected and remediated. By doing so, we are able to invest in uh, CPU isolation strategies across our multi-tenant compute fleet, and we expect to invest more uh, in this area through the leverage that we get from eBPF. So if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, a Netflix blog went live yesterday, which was written by our compute and performance teams. So do check it out how we are leveraging this. The next one I want to talk about is BPF Top. I want to give a shout out to Jose Fernandez, who really identified that we are missing a tool which can do real-time eBPF monitoring. So like who's really watching the watchers, right? And Jose went and created this uh, dynamic real-time view of eBPF programs that B BPF Top can provide. It spits out stats like average execution runtime, events per second, CPU utilization. And since it has been released about six months back, it got rapid adoption in the industry. We saw multiple GitHub stars and forks to the project as well as a lot of hits on the hacker rank. So if you're already using eBPF in your fleet, then do consider using this tool, uh, which is open sourced uh, to monitor your fleet more efficiently. So next use case I wanna talk about is Dropio, which is a rapid fire DDoS mitigation tool that we have built in recent times. So for a minute to understand why this is important, we process millions of packets per second that enter through the front door of Netflix. And it's really important to protect our entire fleet from DDoS attacks that are very commonplace these days. In order to do so, it's important to do it faster, more efficiently, and do it closer to the edge as much as possible. So we invested in building this eBPF-based module that is actually highly efficient in enforcing IP-based rules and uh, is essentially a user space program that pulls for the rules engine, marshals it to the kernel, and kernel performs the enforcement and sends back the results to the user space program. Pretty simple. But what it really enables for us is dropping the packets very early at the XDP eBPF layer without having to traverse the whole network stack, thus saving a lot of resources that are needed in the process. So the early results have been really impressive. And what we see is Dropio consumes only 4% of CPU for the same amount of packets per second that we would have to process in um, previous rejection mechanisms at the L4 or the L7 layer. So uh, these wins are not only important from an efficiency standpoint, but they are also important for us to have the safety and reliability of running our fleet and protecting us from DDoS attacks so that you can continue to watch your favorite Netflix show without any interruptions. So I hope this was useful and 
Again, I'm really grateful that we don't have to imagine a world without eBPF and the future generations will benefit from eBPF for years to come. Thank you. Thank you.